for those who do not know uh, me, my name is Nadine Shahadeh. Uh, I'm a senior financial sector specialist with CGAP, have been covering the Arab world for a number of years. And prior to joining CGAP, uh, was uh, working in microfinance rating for Planet Trading for a number of years, uh, covering also the Arab world, but also uh, the world as a whole. Um, I'm joined today and very thrilled to have with me uh, on the one hand, Dr. Youssef Fawaz, the executive director of Al Majmoa, uh, the largest microfinance institution in Lebanon, uh, and Dr. Joachim uh, Bald, the um, practice leader at the uh, Frankfurt School of uh, Finance and Management. Um, so I think we're three minutes into the panel, so I guess we can uh, kickstart. We have a poll question for you to start with, just to uh, guard your familiarity uh, with Lebanon. So do you actually work on or in Lebanon? Uh, it would be, this will help us know how much uh, context we should actually uh, focus on. Um, so there's not a lot of us so far. Uh, seven attendees uh, split half-half between people who do know the context and some who do not. Uh, and we have new attendees joining. So welcome, you get straight into the poll that's open. Uh, so please let us know if you're familiar with the Lebanese context, uh, work on Lebanon or not. Um, and I think, uh, okay, so we have a slight majority who has not uh, worked on Lebanon and more attendees joining as we speak. We were told by the organizers that it takes a few minutes for people to join. I guess it's the end of a session and the beginning of another one. So welcome to the ones who just uh, joined us for this fantastic panel uh, where we will share the bit of an insane uh, story that we've been uh, living in Lebanon for the past two years. Uh, I see that we're heading to a majority of people who are not familiar with the Lebanese context. So without further ado, let me end the poll and uh, start by explaining a little bit this uh, context. So I think you can see the results. Uh, we have about two thirds of the participants who are not very familiar with the Lebanon context. So uh, let me start with that. And for a reminder, for those who joined us a bit late, uh, there's a Q&A button. Um, you're welcome to put your questions as we speak in there and we'll do our best to answer them. This will be organized in uh, three parts. I'll start by presenting the context. Dr. Fawaz will present uh, what that means for a microfinance institution in Lebanon. And Dr. Bald will walk us uh, through what does an exchange uh, crisis actually mean. Uh, and we'll have Q&A throughout. So you're welcome to put your questions and we'll answer them. And obviously we'll have a Q&A as well at the end. We have a couple of other uh, polls that are upcoming. Um, but so let me first start by uh, telling you what's, uh, what's happening in Lebanon and why we're living through a crisis. Uh, there's three big reasons. Essentially, I will not get into the details. There's ample literature. And if you need any, I'm happy to share some links. But in a nutshell, big fiscal and trade balance deficits combined with declining capital inflows that has affected the available foreign exchange reserves. And that has led to a very big political and financial crisis, uh, a run on banks in 2019, a sovereign default in 2020, and throughout a proliferation of different exchange rates in the market. And Dr. Bold will walk us through the intricacies of those. Um, the, my colleagues at the World Bank in a report called the Lebanon Economic Monitor that's published every six months have classified uh, the Lebanese crisis as one of the worst three for the past 150 years. Uh, that's just to give you a little bit the magnitude of uh, what's going on. This is equivalent to the sort of destruction of value that you see during war times. And so the GDP has shrunk. You see in the chart, it was minus 20% as of 2020. 2021, we're headed to a reduction by 35%. It used to be about $50 billion. Now it's around $30 billion. We have a triple digit inflation for two years in a row. Um, and we have an increase in poverty 
Uh, we used to have around 20, 25% of the population living below the poverty line that has increased in 2020 to 55%. And the latest UN estimates is if you take into account multidimensional poverty, uh, you hit very easily 80%. What does that mean in practice? I would like to share this picture that I've received just yesterday. This is the price of a medicine that a colleague of mine takes. You can see the price used to be 9,500 Lebanese pounds. Today, it is sold at 58,000, six times its price as subsidies on medicine are being lifted after subsidies on fuels have been lifted. And that essentially means that the cost of living is dramatically increasing. Obviously, while salaries do not follow that path, that's if people still have a job. So this is a little bit what it means. Now, uh, we did want to go and focus specifically on microfinance borrowers early in 2019 to understand what does that mean. So at TGAP, we started a study in collaboration with the Lebanese Microfinance Association that was carried out by a local survey firm. And we surveyed uh, twice throughout 2020, about 1,000 uh, borrowers. And so by the time we prepped the project, COVID had hit. So we included COVID and the effect of the lockdown. By the time we hit the second uh, wave of interviews, the port of Beirut had actually exploded. And so we also included that. You have a link here to a summary uh, blog of the results. The study itself is available online. Uh, but let me tell you what we saw in practice. Around 30% of the borrowers had become inactive. Uh, and about an extra 19% had less stable sources of income. For the micro entrepreneurs, that's about 75% of the borrowers. You had a decrease in sales that was quite dramatic, 94%. And the biggest challenges that they faced were around this proliferation of exchange rates, followed by the fact that they were losing customers. Uh, remember inflation going up. And so people being impoverished means that they can uh, less and less uh, afford uh, to purchase practically anything outside of food. Uh, debt repayment was the third of their con uh, concerns. Um, for the remaining, about 25% of the borrowers uh, who were employees, about 20% lost their jobs. That's back then, probably a lot more today. One in two experienced salary cuts. Even for the ones who maintain their salaries, if you earn around $1,000, $1,500 back then, today in effective purchasing powers, this is roughly the equivalent of $100. And so that's the sort of adjustment that you have to live through. And so I'd like to meet, I'd like you to meet Ferial. She was one of the borrowers that we actually interviewed. Um, we were very much moved by her story to the extent that we actually went and visited her. Um, so Ferial is a microfinance borrower. She lives in the Beka. She's been a very successful entrepreneur. She grew her business, uh, multiple businesses. Actually, her latest one was the one that you see here, a secondhand clothing uh, store. And the last loan she took was $5,000 for a middle-income country uh, that was uh, about half of the GDP per capita over a year. So quite a successful entrepreneur over time. So what happened when the crisis hit? She said, oh, out of ethics, I bought those goods at uh, the peg rate of 1,500 Lebanese pounds, so I have to sell them back at that rate. Otherwise, it's not fair. What that meant is that by the time she had to restock six or eight months later, while the inflation had hit, meaning one, she had to put in a much higher capital, which she could not uh, afford since she had sold most of her stock at the previous uh, prices. And second, her own clients were unable to afford uh, much more expensive goods because it turns out that uh, secondhand clothing, you also buy in bulk. And since a lot of things in Lebanon are imported, secondhand clothing are imported as well. And so as a result, she had to cut on meat, cut on heating during the winter. She had to sell assets, gold and livestock. This is concretely what it means. This is exactly what the results of our studies showed. 80% of the borrowers having dramatically lost purchase, purchasing power and having to adjust to lower standards of living in a very short period of time. This is the very difficult thing is that imagine yourself uh, living normally today and tomorrow the price of fuel goes up 10 times, the price of bread goes up or the bread uh, becomes um, smaller in size, the price of medicine goes up, the price of schooling goes up and you still have the same income. That's if you have an income. 
This is what people had to adjust up to. And we could see in the figures that borrowers have become poorer and their average income fell below $1 per capita per day. Around 40% were unable to meet basic needs. 60% had cut on food consumption. Uh, one and two were expected to have depleted the savings by year end, so that was 2020. Um, and a number of them actually had to sell uh, assets. Uh, a number of them were also looking to transferring their children from public school, uh, from sorry, private to public schools, uh, which are renowned to be of lower quality in Lebanon and historically had primarily around 20% of the kids, which more or less matched the uh, poverty rate in Lebanon. And so there is a big fear on long term consequences and intergenerational poverty that might be beginning uh, right now. So what happened to the MFIs in turn? At this stage, they're operating at about half their capacity on the one hand, because demand is not so big, because the economic crisis has not passed yet. And so everything that we've been discussing is still continuing inflation, multiple exchange rates, and deteriorating exchange rate every day. Non-performing rose from excellent historical uh, levels at a, below 1%, to up to 20%, they remain reasonable, especially on newly dispersed portfolio. And as Dr. Bald will show us, uh, the big issues were more around the foreign exchange losses that the MFIs had to bear. Um, and just to close my part of setting the context, I like to show that uh, Kintsuki uh, Bowl, which is a Japanese art where you mend broken things with gold uh, just because they're precious. And that's a little bit our purpose here is to say this microfinance sector that was built over 20 years and that is going through a massive destruction of value, losing human capacity for the past two years. So something to be preserved because there is a silver lining. In our study, what we saw is that 93% of the borrowers were actually satisfied or very satisfied with their microfinance institutions. This is a network of about eight to 10 institutions that have reached out to around 10 to 15% of the Lebanese population. For comparison, it took the UN agencies intervening in Lebanon on the refugee crisis around 10 years to build that same outreach. And so that's why we are here today. We'd like to share our, our experience, but also call for support to help preserve what we have built over years in development in Lebanon. Um, I will stop here for myself. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on the context. Um, I don't see any in the Q&A, but if you have one, please pose it and we'll make sure to address it. Um, and if there's no other question, uh, I would like to hand it on to Dr. Fawaz to walk us through what this actually means uh, for a microfinance institution to be living through all of this. Um, over from my side uh, to you, Dr. Fawaz. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine, uh, for this actually quite uh, comprehensive introduction to what is a pretty dramatic uh, development in a country uh, and uh, microfinance institutions, as you may guess, and from the numbers and the figures you've seen, uh, were literally on the front line to watch the devastation uh, take shape. So quickly, just a very brief snapshot of where we were on the eve of the crisis and how we entered into that maelstrom. We were the largest uh, MFI established in 1998, and we've maintained a steady and sustainable growth for over 20 years. So as of September 2019, literally on the eve of the meltdown, 90,000 clients, 58% of them women, close to $100 million in outstanding portfolio with a power of less than 1%. Total assets, about $121.5 million, an equity that we have built painstakingly over 20 years of $67 million and liabilities of about $54 million. We had 500 staff, about 310 of them loan officers and working from 30 offices uh, across the country. And we had a very solid non-financial services department 
uh, that was providing uh, courses, training, vocational training, and whatnot across the country for the last 15 or so years. All this built with a very strong, trusting relationship with the clients and the partners as well, who helped finance our growth during this period. So you think would be with that, such a solid uh, financial and operational performance would be ready to withstand any onslaught of uh, economic uh, downturn. Well, as you can see here, we the devastation was complete. The growth years for the last 20 that culminated with a roughly $100 million in portfolio at the uh, September of 2019 just crumbled in the face of uh, an exchange rate. And I'm sure Dr. Bold will talk more about it, so I will not expand time. But just for you to know that we've been with a very rigid peg for the last 20, 25 years, actually, of $1,500 to the, to the dollar, 1,500 the Venice pound to the dollar. This allowed us to borrow on international markets with no hedging, allowed us to repay loans for years and years. And we unlent to our clients in dollars and we recovered in dollars. And that was the most common and most simple way to run the business for all these years. And then as the crisis hit, and the exchange rate faltered. So our assets at the end of 2020 are discounted at 82.60 to the pound. And at, uh, in September 21, at 20,000 Lebanese pound to the dollar. So the impact has been nothing but uh, most, most traumatic. I will walk you through the couple of years, I mean, it's slightly more than a couple of years, but for all intents and purposes, we'll begin with 2020, even though the crisis hit at 2019. I will not go into details, obviously, of everything we've done, because and we really did a lot. We changed course, we changed tactics, we changed strategies, we changed uh, uh, immediate action plans, all in response to an unfolding and extremely volatile volatile environment. So I will summarize literally by highlighting the, 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 most, uh, the most important one. So let's say Q1 in 2020, we were, you know, first footsteps waiting to see the government had resigned, the, the banks had closed in, in November, uh, there was a capital control, illegal, by the way, imposed by the banks unilaterally, we couldn't access our liquidity anymore. And the exchange rate started fluctuating on the market. So first steps, we said, fine, we're solid. We have $67 million in equity. We we'll lose a few if we recover money at uh, slightly more than the exchange rate, no problem. We think of our clients, we'll accept the 1500 repayment uh, and we'll see uh, how much we can withstand, but the loss should be manageable. Dollars were missing in the market. You could no longer, neither our, our clients nor us could access dollars anymore. So we had to quickly launch an LBD product. We wanted to launch a local currency. We did this in the first queue of uh, the first quarter of 2020. And we hardly had launched this that we came into the COVID lockdown. So to add uh, to our difficulties, uh, lockdown for a couple of months, when we quickly decentralized, adopted remote, uh, remote work measures that worked quite well. But that was also the time when we were taking stock that uh, the goals that we had planned for in our business plan, which is to reach 100,000 clients by the end of 2020, are not going to pan out. And we may have to let go of staff we had hired at the end of 2019, who were still in probation period and scaled down. So we went down from 500 to about 400 staff. By Q3, the government was discussing uh, an economic recovery plan. And we thought uh, an official devaluation is imminent. They had started negotiation with the IMF, timidly maybe at the beginning. But we thought sooner or later, there will be a come a point when the government will announce this is the roadmap for economic recovery. This is what the package with the IMF is. And this is what the new peg 
or the new exchange rate is and the new devaluation is. So we yield into starting a redenomination because even though our lender, our clients have taken loans in dollars, they were paying us still at 1500 uh, official peg while the dollar was already uh, flirting with uh, five and 6,000 at the time. So we began a redenomination drive and with the lenders, we had already started discussions about that restructuring uh, for our outstanding liabilities. In the midst of this, August 4, Port Blast, government resignation, signaling a very long and protracted political gridlock. We stayed without a government for about 13 months after this date. So 13 months of no political uh, government, no functioning government, no discussions, no economic recovery, roadmap, nothing continued the free fall economically. So with Q4, we uh, shelved sort of the debt restructuring. How can you restructure a debt when you don't even have a devaluation rate out there? And we moved the discussion with the lenders into a standstill agreement. And for us, we were starting to take stock about all the figures that are becoming very real that uh, Nadine spoke about, I mean, how our clients have been affected. And we started looking at ways to fundraise uh, to maybe help some of these clients stay on their feet and we launch a crowdfunding platform alert.world in which we try to fundraise for our clients so with the aim of helping them with cash grant injection for about six months literally to tie them up until the situation stabilizes and they can resume uh, their activities throughout this period you can feel that i mean we really actually bugged our clients with focus groups phone calls surveys literally checking up on them, how they were doing, what they needed. And what ended up coming to this platform fundraising is what already Nadine mentioned, we felt how many really needed food subsidies. They no longer are clients of micro loans. They literally wanted food subsidies. And so we entered with this difficult position into the, our second year of crisis 2021. So new year, new difficulties. We had a small period of relative stability, I would say, the foreign exchange. So we got ready to launch a newly revamped loan uh, in LBP. Literally on the eve, at the end of January 2021, we were about to launch it, the FX jumped from 8,000 to 15,000. We stopped the rollout and we get back into restudying how we can uh, relaunch a product when such a hyperinflationary environment is upon us. The Q6, we had the second lockdown, again, observing a significant drop in demand from 200 loans per day to less than 30 per day, leading us in Q7 to rethink everything we're doing, to rethink our right sizing, rethink what market segment we're going to loan, we're going to target, and rethink of expanding our services in the non financial uh, district. And in the midst of this, we suffered yet another number of crises. Fuel and power shortages began in June, July, August. I mean, literally queues at gas stations. Uh, fuel was non-existent. Uh, power electricity was down to two hours a day, if at all. So counting on private generators to provide electricity. And with the price of fuel and fuel shortages going through the roof, uh, it became an impossible business to run. And the foreign exchange jumped from 15 to 21,000. In Q8, where we're still at this point, we've already undergone our second wave of layoff with now around 300 staff. We were able to shift about 35 to 40 from the operation into the non-financial services. But nevertheless, we closed down 10 branches to reduce cost. And I would point out at this stage that our staff we continue paying them at the same rate, no salary increase since the beginning of the crisis. So today they're living with about an 80% salary cut monthly, which is no longer a living wage. If we look at how we dispersed, uh, beginning with September 19, this is roughly, we were coasting at the speed of about seven to 8,000 loans dispersed per month. And then you can see the dramatic drop in October and November when the crisis hits. The COVID, in April and May of 20, COVID-1, 
big pickup with the renomination drive when we thought that there is an economic recovery plan in place and we gave top up and grace period to our clients. So we picked up speed on uh, loans again, just the blast in August 4th, and we never really recovered from this for the next three, four months, as you can see. COVID number two, lockdown hit down to zero practically in terms of disbursement. Picking up again in March through July at about a costing speed of 3,000, I would say between 2,500 and 3,000 loans. So a quarter to a third of what we were before the crisis. Until again, the power and fuel outages of the summer and the spike in dollar exchange rate made us uh, go down to about 1,000 per month. Our portfolio at risk, historically, always less than 1%. Two spikes, one was due in July 2006 because of a war uh, that was quite devastating and at the time had displaced a third of our clients. It took us a few months to be able to track them down and they could go back to their pace, uh, their living and businesses, but maintained steady below one for the next 10, 12 years until the crisis of the fall of 2019. We hit 20 one percent at the end of 2020 down now to about 17 percent but i would stress like uh, nadine has already mentioned we uh, this accounts for still loans we're carrying from the pre-crisis that are still because uh, some people are still paying and this is where the height of the delinquency is the portfolio at risk on our lebanese farm portfolio is closer to six and seven percent these days. So not where we had been historically, but considering the state of the economy, I would still think uh, quite reasonable. And as a quick note on this, I would say COVID in a sense, given where we've been, uh, has been relatively marginal, which is 17 percent. So when, what next? Still uncertainty prevails, we're not sure when and how. I mean, a new government has been formed, but they've met only a couple of times, and then they've been paralyzed since October 12th. So government has been unable to meet. They've initiated a discussion with the IMF, but not much progress is there, and political gridlocks is, remains. It remains untenable for us to lend in LBP under hyperinflation. We would like to start lending again in USD because, and I think Dr. Wald will mention this, the economy is slowly and creepingly becoming more dollarized. People are asking for fresh dollars, what we call fresh dollars, meaning real bills in dollars for re in return for goods and services. And we need for this to be able to access funds in USD. Today, our funds are either locked in the bank and are no longer translatable to USD or have become in Lebanese pound because our clients have paid back what they borrowed in, in dollars in, in Lebanese, in Lebanese uh, pounds. And uh, with our inability to pay living wages at this stage, we're starting to observe staff attrition, and most importantly, at the level of senior and middle management, because they're being tempted uh, by other institutions. And yet, coming back to the silver lining, my argument is an institution that has taken 20 years to build, uh, deserves a chance to continue being there because it can and can deliver on a number of levels. True, we've been battered by two years of operating in crisis mode, but we remain relevant. Operations have continued and visibility in the market has been maintained. We have deployed as much as we could effort to stabilize the portfolio and the institution and preserving human capital. Even though we let go of 40%, we still believe today with, with a team of 300, we are still in a very strong position to resume operations uh, as soon as the situation stabilizes. We've been able to maintain our trust with our clients, with our staff, with our investors, and we've deployed our utmost to preserve and a high value infrastructure that we built over 20 years. We do believe, Al Majmua, but I think also the other players in that field in the microfinance sector are still the best place to hit the ground running when the situation stabilizes, which could, given all the dramatic changes, remain a most positive outcome to all stakeholders. 
I would just conclude on a couple of things that we wouldn't have been able actually to withstand the severity of the meltdown that we've been through without support from our investors. And they have been here, they have been patient, they have been understanding, they've been empathetic. And many of them, I have to say, have even come through with uh, financial aid. Some have uh, given us technical assistance and some have even uh, given us access to funds to be able, for example, to pay uh, software licenses. Since we under capital control, we've been unable to pay and to send any dollars outside the country. So many, a couple of our uh, lenders have been able to uh, pay us in real dollars so we can renew our licenses with Microsoft, uh, the uh, cloud uh, management and whatnot. And second, I would really have to also underline it is the strong sense of ownership uh, by the staff. I mean, had they given that they're taking an 80% and 90% in the case of management uh, pay cut, had there not been a sense of ownership and commitment to this institution, I'm sure many of them would have left us a very long time ago. And that will end on this talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fawaz. I saw that uh, in your last slide, you were answering the one question that we've had around what are the actions that your investors have taken uh, to help you and other MFIs survive the crisis. So just to give a little bit more of context, uh, the exposure of international lenders to Lebanon on the microfinance sector alone, uh, so let alone the banking sector, which is an equivalent or actually worse situation, is of around $80 million. And so we'll get straight uh, into what this might mean, but that's just to give you an idea. So you have two processes going on, one where you're trying to support MFIs, uh, survive, but on the other hand, you also have to manage this exposure. I don't know, Dr. Fawaz, if you want to add anything on that point. And I will ask uh, Delphine, please, to run the next poll uh, while we're doing that. We have a nice question that will lead us straight into uh, Dr. Bolt's uh, intervention around how much do you get for $1 in Lebanon today? So while you're answering that, I'll give you back the uh, floor, Dr. Fawaz. Um, actually, I no, I mean, you, you've summed it up quite, quite well. This is exactly where, uh, where things uh, are standing. Uh, the, uh, the discussions with the lenders have been extremely helpful in, in, in a way because they help stabilize. I mean, this is one thing less to worry about that the patients they've displayed and the fact that they were willing to uh, accommodate uh, the needs of the institutions of microfinance during this period has been uh, relatively, not relatively, I mean, quite supportive. And uh, this has been key for us to continue through this period. Thank you. We have very interesting results uh, on the poll. Uh, I'll stop it right now. Actually, we have around 76% of participants who did participate. And I will show the results because they're uh, quite interesting. Um, I will <laughs> give it to Dr. Ball to walk us through. For me, the answer is really, it depends. And in our daily life, you know, Dr. Fawaz, my, we're constantly having an Excel file running because you do need Excel at this stage to understand how much is this actually costing me? When I earn that money, how much is it worth? When I'm withdrawing it from the bank, how much am I actually getting worth for every dollar? And when I'm purchasing something, is this important vast majority of the case? It's yes, so it's costing me that much. And so how much of a discount am I actually getting on money that I actually earn uh, through work? And so it's interesting that nobody picked up the 3,900 because that's actually the effective rate at which myself, Nadin Chahari, can withdraw my dollars that I have earned from CGAP and that are stuck in a Lebanese bank. I do spend them though at the market rate, which today is closer to 23,000. So uh, for more of this, I'll hand it to you, Dr. Ball, to walk us through the intricacies of all of this. Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me, Nadine, and uh, allowing me to play my favorite role as uh, armchair analyst here on the sidelines, uh, watching um, how you've actually, uh, since 
when we first met uh, Yusef uh, in December 2019, um, how you've been working through this monumental crisis, surviving, adapting, um, and we're just uh, kind of analyzing on the sidelines, how much does it hurt now? Is it getting worse now? Uh, so this is, uh, this is my little contribution here to uh, try to put this into perspective. Uh, is this unique? Have we ever seen uh, a forex crisis like this? And the answer is no, it is in many ways just another forex crisis, but it unfolds, uh, of course, in, in, in slightly different ways. And uh, there's layers to this crisis that we haven't seen before. Um, so we need a bit of a different vocabulary for uh, thinking about foreign exchange crises in emerging markets. Because uh, we may be used to the little screen corner here where we keep the euro US dollar ticker going and the daily up and down volatility of, of forex markets. And that's very different in emerging economies. And right? it's not just the when the exchange rate changes, that is forex risk. Um, and that what's different is in emerging markets, um, the exchange rates aren't freely floating, liquidly traded, atomistic with thousands of traders pushing the buttons at, uh, um, at every second, uh, with deep forward markets where we can do hedging, cross-currency swaps, macro overlays, uh, and all of this. This is very different in most emerging markets. Uh, so what makes it different is uh, that almost everywhere where we work in microfinance and where development and emerging uh, business uh, occurs, we live in a structural current account deficit environment. And that means there's never enough Forex to go around for all the imports uh, of goods and services. And it's always a constraint um, that uh, uh, the FX revenue uh, is never enough for everybody. Uh, and that makes uh, the currency not a two-way uh, street anymore. Uh, the risks are stacked. Uh, in a directional sense that um, if you wonder uh, where tomorrow's exchange rate might be, it's going to end up um, in either stable or it's going to go down, right? There's no way uh, that uh, uh, we would ever go back uh, to, uh, to uh, Lebanese pounds, US dollar exchange rates uh, that are half of what we see today uh, in the market. Or if you look at the Turkish lira, we will never go back to to Turkish lira, uh, to, uh, to a USD, which was uh, kind of a benchmark for quite a while, right? It's either stable, it's either pegged, or uh, it's gonna go down uh, the other direction. So that's the directional vulnerability that we have to deal with. Um, and that makes also hedging uh, uh, much more difficult. Uh, and because people have a long memory, right? There's, even though there's a local currency, uh, people have a long memory of previous episodes of, uh, of devaluation. So there is a tendency between residents uh, for the big stuff, uh, at least to deal in a foreign anchor currency, Euro or US dollar. And that leads to this partial uh, dollarization that we also saw in Lebanon before the crisis already. And uh, uh, that then requires that uh, um, uh, authorities manage the, uh, the parity, manage access to, to the markets, and uh, that is possible then to stabilize for a while uh, an exchange rate uh, or even peg it, uh, but the peg is only pegged until it's no longer pegged, right? That's the, the slogan on the wall, and uh, we've seen that uh, not just in, in Lebanon, we've seen this in 2016 uh, in, uh, in Egypt, we've seen it uh, in 2015, 16 in Azerbaijan, we've seen it in Turkey uh, in 2001, and also currently we've seen it in Argentina in 2001, 2018 again. Um, so that leaves a lasting memory of the possibility of a peg breaking and a, a major devaluation uh, occurring, which already shapes people's behavior. Uh, to analyze uh, FX risk in emerging markets, we got to get beyond just the top layer of when the exchange rate changes and it hurts, that's FX risk, true, right? Uh, but there's also convertibility and transfer risk and currency induced credit risk. Those are uh, always part of the mix. And we will, I'll show you here in a minute how that plays out in Lebanon. Convertibility and transfer risk is essentially um, the authorities saying, um, 
what you see there is an official exchange rate, um, $4 per ruble in 1989 or 1500 uh, LBP for a US dollar. That exchange rate is not for you, right? Uh, certain people can buy, uh, importers of children's medicines may be able to access at that rate, but not everybody gets that rate to buy US dollar. Um, that's convertibility risk and transfer risk simply means uh, you may have an onshore US dollar account, but you cannot transfer it out of the country. And that is usually uh, just simply the realization of the fact uh, that those dollars that you see in your USD account, uh, they're no longer mirrored to actual uh, interbank balances that are settable in New York. Right? And so they've already been lent to the Lebanese government, the Lebanese government spent them, and there's nothing there in return once uh, the Lebanese government defaulted on the uh, US dollar denominated debt. Um, there's nothing coming back, so there's nothing to settle in New York, uh, hence transfer risk. Currency induced credit risk is that part where uh, ordinary residents, companies, consumers uh, borrow in the foreign currency and essentially service that debt with local currency revenue then the exchange rate changes and you have to pay double, triple uh, to, uh, to pay the bill. Um, that's definitely also part of the mix here. However, um, if you have onshore US dollars, right, that's one of the few things that you can still do is settle onshore US dollar Lebanese uh, borrowings um, one for one. Right? And so uh, if you have on both sides of the balance sheet, uh, those uh, now frozen onshore US dollars, then you're actually a little bit lucky. Uh, so let's move on uh, to the madness of all of these various exchange rates that came out in the poll. And uh, uh, there's a different exchange rate for each occur occasion. And usually when you want to uh, buy dollars, uh, look for the highest one. That's the one that you're gonna be paying. And if you have dollars and uh, uh, crazy enough to want LVP for it, uh, be careful that you don't get the lowest one here on the chart. Um, so the, the chart shows you the, uh, the, the green line at the bottom, and that is the original peg trade uh, of 1508. That still exists, it's still on the Banque du Bon website as the official exchange rate. Uh, and if you don't watch it, as you put in your foreign credit card, uh, to pay a Lebanese pound bill, that may be what's being applied to you. So you gotta be really careful there. Um, then there's uh, that, uh, that red line that's been staggered up to 3,900. And that's what Nadine was referring to. Uh, that's what she gets for a US dollar uh, in an onshore account if you want to uh, take it in LVP cash, um, which is the only thing that you can do. Uh, taking the LVP cash, you'll get 3,900 for it, even with limits on how much you might be able to withdraw at that rate. Uh, while the, uh, the store that you're going to spend it at uh, will pay um, either 23,000 or a little bit lower rate, uh, the um, SI Rafa import rate, um, at which they import the container of, uh, of merchandise uh, from abroad that they sell in a store. So uh, there's a wide gap between the buy and the sell, the bid and the offer. And that is what uh, um, is killing us in so many ways. What makes it so complicated is that we used to have dollars and LVPs and uh, now we have different flavors of it. Uh, so these are actually critically important to understand. That's why I put them on the left side with a bit of a definition. Um, we have those onshore US dollar bank balances. Um, at the Lebanese bank, uh, you had a dollar denominated bank account. And before the crisis, you could send a uh, international transfer for your kids to study abroad. Uh, and that would get one for one, the dollar uh, dispersed overseas that you have in your, in your account. These are now frozen and they've become very restricted Lebanese dollars or colloquially known as lollars. Um, and then there's the actual US dollar physical cash. Uh, you used to be able to get US dollar physical cash for dollar account balances, pretty much one-to-one, -one, maybe a small cash handling fee. Um, 
that is changed. That is uh, the US dollar physical bill. You cannot get that uh, initially with very limited amounts, but that is the, the problem. You can't withdraw uh, dollar account balance into physical cash anymore. The physical cash, US dollar, that is the gold standard. That's what's, uh, uh, what keeps the country running. Um, and it's really wads of uh, US dollar cash uh, that is now the currency de facto in, um, in Lebanon. Uh, with all its constraints of being not uh, swipeable, not contactless, RFD, uh, wallet, whatever, is this really $100 bills hidden in your socks? Uh, that's what you have to work with. Um, then there's the LBP, um, the national currency. Um, you, you may have uh, them in physical cash or in accounts. Uh, that's, of course, impacted by the hyperinflation that we see. The price is just going through the roof. Um, and there's even a preference for physical LBP cash, uh, which is no longer one for one redeemable from an LBP account. There's heavy discounts. If you have book money LBP, uh, it will be difficult to get 100% value for that uh, in duffel bags of, uh, of LBP bills. Uh, so that is actually the last constraint on the highest of the exchange rates that you see, the street rate, at which uh, you can exchange physical LBP bills uh, for physical US dollar bills. Um, that is con that's a free market, it's a gray market, um, and it's constrained by the availability of the actual physical bills and coins uh, that you need to bring. And that's true even for, for LBP because uh, the, uh, the, num the zeros are, keep, uh, are growing and there's not enough physical printed LBP in circulation. Then there's this thing of US dollar fresh balances. Uh, so recently transferred, recently received uh, inbound USD uh, into an account um, that uh, you will be able to get value for in US dollar, but it's unclear how long uh, something that's fresh remains fresh in a, uh, in a bank account. And so there's a date uh, after which the crisis started. And if you received, uh, USD after that, then there should still be fresh. Uh, but tell me who's trusting that? Uh, that is, uh, of course, an open question. So uh, right now, the real hard currency is physical US dollar bills and coins. Uh, and that's uh, what rules the country. And that's what's king. Um, So Joachim, just as yeah. we transition, a reminder, we have 11 minutes left. I'm answering some okay. questions in the chat, but okay. just for you to know. Yeah, so sorry that this took me so long. The, the remainder is actually then just the application of this. Um, a reminder, when we did this study uh, of the microfinance sector uh, in, um, in early 2020, uh, we, we did a kind of a static stress test, uh, how, how far could the exchange rate move before everything blows up? Um, and we were well beyond that point. But what was interesting as a result from that is uh, the starting point, even though that was already in March 2020 when COVID had just begun and the first wave of the crisis had already become uh, apparent, the starting point highlights the actual underlying health of the microfinance industry. Right? Uh, this is not a typical microfinance crisis, uh, over indebtedness, uh, you know. Um, uh, high leverage, uh, irrational exuberance uh, and disbursements. No, it was a very prudently managed uh, sector, um, good liquidity, uh, low portfolio at risk, uh, uh, overall uh, very high capitalization, low leverage. Uh, it was not a, a microcredit crisis uh, at the beginning. And uh, even in March, uh, yes, the uh, the portfolio at risk had uh, shot up a little bit, but entirely manageable given the uh, liquidity and given the low uh, leverage of the of the sector. So I think we need to impress that again and again. This is not a microcredit crisis. It was not Yousef's fault, right? That we got here. Um, and now, how did this uh, this squeeze uh, occur on a, a microfinance balance sheet? Uh, that's what this slide is about, uh, just stylized in, in percent uh, of a typical balance sheet structure. 
um, you see the, uh, the light orange uh, layers, that is uh, Lawler's. The dark red is actual US dollars owned, uh, owed to foreign counterparties. And the green is local currency LVP. Um, and on the asset side, you see lots of things shrinking. And on the liability side, you see uh, the dark red um, uh, foreign borrowings in USD. You see that massively expanding. And that is the squeeze. Uh, the, uh, the Lawlers uh, in the portfolio, you cannot collect them in physical USD from the borrowers, impossible. You have to convert it to LVP at a sub-market rate. That squeezes it. Uh, the Lawlers in the bank account, uh, we discussed it. You can't take them out. They're frozen. You get the uh, differential rates. That squeezes it massively. Um, the Lawlers on the liability side, if you were lucky to have some, Right? You can easily settle off with the lollas that you still have in the bank account or that you might be acquiring. So that's easy. Uh, LVP borrowings, also easy. You can pay that back with the uh, inflated, uh, uh, inflated LVP. That's also why, to some extent, even in the depth of the crisis, we haven't had that big of a flame out in the portfolio because local currency debt uh, with the inflation going on is really just a convenience factor. Do you get time? Do you get around to paying that? Uh, is it physically possible to pay the, uh, the installment? But the old installment is now so small in real, uh, in real value that that shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, so e relatively easy to maintain LBP debt service because of the inflation. Um, but for, for the lender, that totally uh, squeezes the asset side, exploses. Uh, explodes the uh, uh, the foreign borrowings, uh, which are currently frozen under transfer restrictions. But eventually, if you want to pay them back, you will have to buy the dollars at the street rate. Uh, so that squeeze uh, uh, is just absolutely deadly. Um, and that's what Yosef has been, been telling us. Um, uh, it makes lending uh, currently uh, very difficult and unprofitable because you cannot charge enough interest to cover uh, a, a real return on such a hyperinflationary LVP. So uh, that's where we are, uh, and we need uh, we need we need a solution. We need a big bang uh, that sets what the deal is, uh, what the haircut will be on uh, on dollars, and what the new paradigm will be. Um, very likely, unfortunately, um, that will be a full dollarization. We we're all hoping that um, we could do something. Uh, in, in the way of a currency reform uh, that would uh, kind of level the playing field again and make the rules clear and transparent. But that requires a lot of trust. Right? And uh, so much trust uh, has been wasted uh, in the last two years that it's, you know, maybe I'm too pessimistic with the input of the IMF and uh, with the international community providing backup. Um, maybe we can launch a new LBP a new uh, local currency, but uh, people are voting with their feet right now and uh, they're, they're moving towards a full dollarization. Uh, I'll stop my prepare to marks here. Um, happy to, uh, to take questions and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting uh, situation. Thank you, Joachim. I will just end very rapidly and there's a question to you on like, uh, that's not the only country uh, with hyperinflation. What have we learned from other countries? Uh, but let me, before we get to that question very rapidly, uh, share a little bit what uh, we see as a role moving forward for donors and investors. I think on the very short run, uh, the sector is going through a valley of death, uh, essentially. And what is very important is that the sector is stabilized, that it survives so that we do not have to rebuild in a year or two from zero. This is particularly important. Uh, and second part is we need to pilot new products. There is demand for new products. It might be lower than what it was, but it is here. And there needs to be new money coming in to pilot those new products and take them to scale so that there's new avenues for growth for those MFIs. So that's on the immediate run. And the second thing there's no way around it. There will be losses. There's a need to restructure the current exposure, $80 million, again, of external debt. There needs to be a new financing model that somehow hedges this exchange rate risk, even on the residual uh, amount. 
And we have thought through possible blended finance solutions of a reasonable size compared to the magnitude of the crisis. We're speaking about losses in billions of dollars in Lebanon. Uh, to stabilize a sector that's supporting 10 to 15% of the population, we're speaking of a cash injection of about 30 to $50 million. So that's really important and that only donors and investors can do at this stage in the country. Uh, so we'll not get into the rest of the details, but there might be an IMF deal, there might not be any IMF deal, but what we really, really want to get to is a microfinance sector that is preserved, and we do not want to get to the worst outcome, which is a lower access to finance for around, well, I'm saying 10, 15% of the population, those are the people who used to have access to microfinance. In a country, they used to be highly banked with over 50% of the population that was banked. Today, that 50% no longer has access to financial services. So there's a huge opportunity. At the same time, there were living a huge squeeze in access to finance. And this is really what we want to try to preserve. And again, we do not want to build it again from scratch in two years from now. And this is what each and every one of us working in the sector can do today. If you have any other questions, do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. If you're interested in the blended finance solutions, do reach out to me. Uh, and Joachim, I'll give it back to you to answer the question on hyperinflation. Yeah, uh, the questions go in the direction of what can we learn from other countries, uh, parallel similar crises. Um, and uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, what happens is uh, the, uh, uh, the good money squeezes out the bad money, right? Unless you have uh, some form of a, a big bang uh, that can re-inspire confidence uh, in this new uh, currency setup and, and create the impression that this will hold, right? This is not just lopping off a couple of zeros and then we just start inflating again. Um, this will hold now, right? Um, and that is very difficult to do to build that confidence. Uh, it requires a concerted effort from, uh, from international development agencies, from the uh, monetary fund, but it also needs uh, the, the political will and the resolve uh, on the ground. So um, that means uh, which currency it will be, uh, some form of a currency board with support from, uh, from uh, external parties, that might be uh, workable. Uh, a full dollarization uh, might also be a, a reasonable, credible path, but that means not just uh, dollar bills in the socks, but also book money dollars that, uh, that will not suffer the same fate as the, uh, the dollars currently. Uh, so all of that um, requires external backing, right? But the, the point that I want to also maybe in closing emphasize is that um, We've got an amazing platform here with, uh, with the microfinance sector that has been able to maintain the trust of the, of the population and um, that can really uh, bring out the strength of the Lebanese people uh, and their natural advantages in the location and the, um, the climate. And uh, it's not for nothing that uh, you know, Lebanese have this reputation of uh, brilliant traders all across Africa and elsewhere in the world. Um, we just need to give them a reason to bring the money back to Lebanon, right? And in this chaos, everybody's waiting. But once you've got a clear framework, um, then uh, the investment will flow again, microfinance can work again, and uh, the Youssef and, uh, and other institutions on the ground, uh, they're standing ready uh, to, uh, to back um, the, uh, the entrepreneurial uh, classes in um, and uh, the small businesses, those that will roll up their sleeves and rebuild Lebanon, right? We just need somebody to fire the starting gun and say, this is the deal, these are the rules, now let's get going. And uh, what we're doing now is holding over the infrastructure for that day after. And uh, that's what we're really working towards. Thank you, uh, Joachim. I think we're at the top of the hour. So I think I will thank both you, but particularly you, because you're in the Bay Area. So it's the middle of your night. So very much I appreciate you making the time. Dr. Fawaz, thank you for sharing your experience. I don't know if you want to have any closing uh, words. 
Uh, and I see a number of comments that came in on, you know, comparison with other countries. We've been studying that very uh, closely at CGAP. You know, we could speak about this for another hour, any of us three. So please do reach out if there's any specific question or thing that's on your mind. If you have ideas of how things could be solved moving forward, we're all ears. So thank you again, everyone. Dr. Fawaz, anything? A last word? You're good? Great. Thanks everyone, thanks to the participants and thank you for the European Macrofinance Week for hosting us.